Hello everyone, uh, we're getting into the home stretch here. Just a couple more of these video lectures. We've got two more sessions. Tonight we're going to be uh, finishing up our conversation of social and economic justice um, with the uh, Cohen reading. And this one's a really special one. I'm, I'm very excited to, to uh, cover this material. I think this reading is very clever and interesting and thought-provoking, and it puts a good cap on um, the kind of discussions we've been having with uh, Rawls and Nozick. Um, this unit has definitely been um, a pretty big picture one, this unit on social and economic justice. Um, and this is also going to get us into some really big picture thinking. Um, you probably are, are somewhat familiar with, um, or may, maybe, maybe not, I don't want to make any assumptions here, but you might be familiar with uh, criticisms of capitalism, um, the uh, alternatives of socialism and communism to capitalism. Um, I don't know how much uh, familiarity you have with it, but I'm going to offer a little bit of backdrop for that. Um, and I think Cohen does a good job of kind of freshening up that debate and putting um, some really original ideas out there for how to think about that discussion. Um, but it gets into this kind of rethinking of the fundamentals, uh, the foundational sort of constructions that make up the world that we are familiar with, the kind of social rules um, that condition life for us in our society. Um, so I'm happy we're getting into that, and uh, it, it gets me all jazzed up and excited. I, Cohen's a really unique, unique thinker, um, very creative thinker, outside of the box. I think you'll see some arguments here that you might not be familiar with. Um, but it's a pretty, it's a pretty difficult read, um, definitely one of the most challenging ones for the quarter. And so I'll be taking it slow, going piece by piece, walking through Cohen's argument, and that's what we're going to do. Um, I think this one might take a little bit longer. We'll see how it goes. Um, but, uh, but we'll get through it all, and I'll try to explain and cash out everything that Cohen's thinking uh, to the best of my ability and make it uh, maybe a little bit more accessible. Um, a little quick note here before we go uh, further with Cohen, though. Um, I've got a hold of all your uh, paper drafts. Thank you for submitting them. Um, and I've already exchanged them for the response paper. That is due, um, uploaded to Canvas by um, midnight on Friday. That's also a hard deadline um, because grades are due the following Monday. So um, it's going to be tight for me. Uh, if, um, if those are turned in late, I can't promise that you'll get your grade in on time. I can promise that the grade will happen, but it may not happen um, by the time grades are due um, at the end of the quarter if I don't get that in on time. Um, so please hit that deadline um, so that I'll be able to get all the grades done. Um, but I want to mention that if you're, um, the, these papers are not kind of um, uh, previewed by me before I send them out anonymously to all of you. Um, so uh, there might be stuff going on there that you've got questions about or reactions to, and you might want to talk to someone about it, and I'm happy to be that person for you. Um, certainly, uh, I, as I said in the instructions for the assignment, um, you know, there's a difference between um, professional work, professional philosophical work, and that of uh, all of you who are, I, many of you are doing philosophy for the first time in this class. So I think a certain amount of charity and patience with your author is appropriate. Um, they're just trying to figure all this stuff out the same way as you are. Um, but that also might mean that clarity might be a little more difficult. Um, that maybe the paper that you uh, have been assigned is... Uh, maybe confusing or not as clear as maybe some of these uh, or precise as some of these other um, uh, philosophical works that we've been studying. So if you've got questions about like what is the argument here, what's going on, um, I'd be happy to help you kind of work through that paper and decipher what's happening um, and just anything related to these response papers. As always, I'm here um, and I want to help you and I'll be as accessible as I can this week. So please let me know how I can do that. Um, but we're almost done here. It's hard to believe. Um, okay, if you have any questions about what's going on end of quarter and stuff like that, please let me know. Um, I'm I'm always available, and I want to support you in any way I can. Um, so, um, Cohen, yes, very interesting. Uh, I say here at the beginning, by the way, uh, Li Ling, you're in the chat tonight again. Thank you again for showing up. Um, you have been very steadfast with that, and I appreciate that. 
and this lecture in particular and the paper is going to is so complicated <laughs> yeah it, no it's uh it is really appreciated thank you um the paper and and the the lecture i'm going to be giving is somewhat complicated there's a lot of little details and everything so if you've got the cohen lecture notes from canvas i would definitely recommend pulling those up and following along as i go through this and for those of you watching on youtube later it's all up on the screen here and as you see, I say at the beginning here, um, Cohen is a dirty, dirty socialist. That's a little bit of a joke. Um, socialism definitely has uh, kind of in some circles in America, definitely a, a bad name. Um, actually, uh, you, maybe this will be a fun, funny thing. Um, you know how Google sort of tracks your interests and, and uh, identifies kind of what demographic you're in and things like that and then delivers relevant ads to you for whatever reason. Um, I'm not exactly sure why. I wonder what it says about how Google's tracking me or what it says about me. Um, but I get a lot of these advertisements um, uh, when I'm watching YouTube videos for this kind of libertarian think tank. Um, what's it called? Uh, oh, man. I can't pull it off the top of my head right now. But they're not like advertising... Um, products or services or something like that they're advertising ideas philosophical ideas about political economic and social justice and um, they they just I've seen a couple of them I've been like curious like what are you gonna say to me um, and they're just destroying socialism or at least attempting to the arguments have actually been fairly weak I mean it's a advertisement and it's it's basically propaganda but um, Definitely, there is a part of American culture that is strongly resistant to socialism and communism. Um, part of that has to do, I think, with a historical legacy with the Cold War, but also with how much um, capitalism as a mental model, to go back to Warhain, is just really deeply embedded in our consciousness. Um, so much so that uh, we can think of it as kind of this uh, criteria in itself for morality and for justice. And that's one of the things that Cohen's gonna challenge uh, in this paper. Um, so he's definitely um, kind of the underdog when it comes to uh, these philosophical conversations in our society culturally. Um, so he is gonna be defending that. And I have, I've had students in the past who have actually been a little confused about what Cohen's position actually is because of the way that he's arguing for it, which is not really the familiar uh, Marxist line in many places. Um, Karl Marx uh, is who I'm referencing there, um, who uh, sort of set the philosophical and ethical foundations for communism um, and uh, in the late 19th century, early 20th century. Um, and and uh, McCohen is a modern Marxist. He is a contemporary. He's not, um, he's um, in recent memory. I think he's, I think he died at, uh, he, I don't think he's still alive. But it's pretty close, um, definitely in the way that uh, philosophy uh, gauges history. It's recent memory um, for Cohen. And uh, he, he's probably one of the most preeminent Western philosophers who um, uh, defends Marxism, who defends communism and socialism and things like that. Um, but he is going to do it in a really uh, weird sort of way. Um, I'm anticipating, I, this is one of the readings where I'm really, really... Um, sad that it's online and so I don't get to talk with all of you in person about this. Um, students always have a lot of objections to socialism uh, and communism and this kind of uh, uh, cha challenging of our social and legal conventions around private property ownership. Um, but Cohen's going to be challenging that stuff and I'm going to try to do justice to his paper. Um, I do want to kind of say for the record that I'm not trying to uh, in some way um, what's the word, evangelize for Marxism or try to convert you or something like that. But I think the way that Cohen frames the debate uh, is, one, uh, very fair. You'll see he um, he doesn't go in for some of the more extreme rhetoric that you sometimes get from anti-capitalist Marxists in today's world. Um, he's happy to grant uh, arguments to his opponents when he thinks that they are legitimate. And he takes a more nuanced and, I think, balanced view of this debate. So um, even if you disagree with him, you might find the way that he's framing this whole discussion very interesting. Um, but I, I have in the past, um, when I've taught this, uh, I've had students kind of um, 
sometimes uh, turn him into a straw man in their criticisms of Cohen. Um, so I think that's something to be careful and on guard against. And, I, and I'd love to be able to kind of uh, play devil's advocate on his behalf to give him uh, a charitable run for his money for his arguments. Sorry, there's like in really intense glare going on through the window. I'm not sure what I can do about that. <laughs> maybe, I, maybe I'll just move my computer. That helps a little bit. There we go. Okay. Um, but this is definitely, this is an anti-capitalist um, position that Cohen is going to be taking, at least to challenge it, to problematize capitalism. Um, and by the way, um, I think uh, Warhane is not a bad um, bit of background for getting into Cohen's discussion here, because um, remember, Warhane was like, when she was offering her um, her attempts to problematize the legitimacy of capitalism as a, a, a moral model, as an economic, as a political model. Um, it wasn't like she was going to straw man capitalism. There's, there's definitely, in terms of capitalism as it exists in our world to get, today, there's a lot of pretty easy criticisms to leverage at it. Ways to say that like uh, our version of capitalism is somewhat dysfunctional, um, it definitely has some moral blind spots to it. There are some bad consequences that come um, from the sort of modern embodiment of capitalism. And Cohen isn't doing something uh, like that. He's not looking to um, straw man capitalism here. I think he, kind of like Warhane, he's like, no, let's look at this in the most legitimate way that it can make a case for itself. Um, that it actually is something that attempts to satisfy some of the things that we think of as central moral goods, especially in the context of this discussion, freedom and liberty. And uh, in, I think a good way to describe, man, the, the sun is moving. <laughs> um, yeah, I'm going to move it a little bit further. There we go. Let's see if we can make it through the sunset. Um, I think a good way to frame Cohen's paper is that he's taking uh, capitalism on on its own grounds, on its own terms, um, playing on his opponent's home turf, so to speak, rather than uh, demanding that the capitalists play on his terms. Um, I think that's really interesting how he does that. I think it makes his arguments uh, all the more plausible um, and that the discussion all the more fair um, in terms of evaluating really what the legitimate merits are of capitalism and how that stacks up against the concerns and the objections. Let's, uh, also from my, remember back from my lecture on Rawls kicking off this unit, I mentioned that there's this kind of classic, um, debate. There's this classic sort of, uh, feud, you might say, although I mean that in the, in the most, uh, cooperative terms, not in just like political infighting, but, in this question around social justice, maybe you remember me framing that in terms of libertarians versus social liberals, and that what defines the debate is that there are these two moral values that we care about. We care about freedom and liberty, and we also care about happiness and well-being for people. Um, and the two positions could maybe be defined based on um, what sort of value they're willing to compromise in part in order to enable the other value to be promoted. So in the traditional way of framing this debate, the libertarian is willing to make some sacrifices when it comes to people's overall happiness in society, uh, their standard of living, their uh, well-being. Um, like you, you might have this kind of huge disparity between wealth um, from the people on the top and the people at the bottom. But that's sort of something that has to be tolerated for the sake of freedom. That's exactly what you got from Nozick, right? Nozick was saying, if you're trying to do this redistribution of resources for the cause of uh, economic equity um, and to eliminate this kind of um, inequality that can happen in society, then you're going to be interfering with people's freedom. And not just a little bit, you'll be doing it a lot and all the time. Um, and that was his major moral argument against his opponents, the social liberals, which maybe or maybe not would include Rawls. We talked about some complexities there, but definitely would include traditionally the kinds of socialist Marxist positions that Cohen's on in the camp of. Um, on the other hand, you have social liberals or Marxists or socialists, people of the uh, communists, people of this stripe, which are willing to maybe sacrifice some liberties, 
uh, and freedoms for the sake of improving people's quality of life and their well-being. That's the way the debate is usually framed. It's not going to be the way that Cohen is going to frame it, which is what is, is sort of the first thing that's surprising and interesting about Cohen. And he actually, in this first section, he's going to clarify um, why he thinks that's not the right way to set it up. Actually, I think it's like the first and second section. Um, thankfully, Cohen has a very organized paper, given how much philosophical territory he's trying to cover, and his argument proceeds in very discrete steps, and I'm going to be following that in my lecture here. Um, but that's a little bit of background here. Think of that as the um, setup for when Cohen is going to jump into the conversation and say, well, maybe we should rethink some things here. Um, not just in terms of fighting for one side, but also in how we understand the disagreement that's taking place here, how we frame that disagreement. So that's, a, that's enough backstory, I think. Um, let's start getting into the details. Uh, again, Leeling, any kinds of questions or things that you want me to clarify uh, or potential objections you have to what's going on or concerns you have about this uh, would be very much appreciated uh, and I think would make the lecture better for everybody. So um, I wish there were more people in the chat, but again, you're my canary in the coal mine. So uh, thank you again for being here. Don't be shy. Okay, so Cohen starts off the paper with maybe something that might have thrown you for a loop right out of the gates, and that's this kind of uh, really detailed, what I call in my lecture notes here, hair-splitting um, sort of uh, way of trying to define freedom. Um, so Cohen claims, one is in general free to do whatever one is forced to do. So the logic he has here is that if you're forced to do something, then you have to be able to do it. You can't be you can't be forced to do something you're not actually able to do. And if you're able to do it, then you must be free to do it. <clears throat> this is kind of the the first sense of freedom that we we might talk about, which is just the ability to do something. And if we're thinking about this in the broader sense of uh, sort of the conventions of social cooperation that give shape to society. Think about it like the laws or rules uh, or procedures that are available to people that tell them what they are in, enabled, uh, enabled to do and what they are disallowed from doing. Um, sort of like what they're empowered to do given that system, what their options are according to those rules, and which things are not. Um, <clears throat> so um, the some of the basic things here are like you are... Um, um, not allowed to steal people's property like that's something right now based on our system of conventions that you wouldn't be allowed to do under capitalism you have conventions of private property ownership and that means that there are certain obligations everyone else is under to respect your property and that means not take it without your permission aka stealing so that's something that our system doesn't allow you to do it does allow you to do other things for example um you are allowed uh, you are free, you have the ability to sell your labor to people. You can put yourself out on the market <clears throat> and see if other people want to freely hire you. That's something you're allowed to do. Um, now, in this sort of thinking, if you've got some concerns, hang on to them. Cohen's going to address them. But what he, he's saying, this is, uh, um, this is an asymmetrical relationship. So by saying that if you are forced to do something, then you are free to do it. If you're forced to do something, then you're able to do it. And if you're able to do it, then you're free to do it. This doesn't mean that you're free to do something. If you're free to do it, then you're able to do it. So for example, oh, someone's trying to call me. I'm gonna block that. Um, no, no, <laughs> sorry, it's beeping, beeping, beeping. Um, here, I'm gonna deal with this. Okay, there, it went away. All right. So, sorry about that. Um, so, uh, there's no laws, for example, uh, this is his English Channel example. There's no laws that say you can't swim the English Channel. Uh, Cohen comes from Britain, by the way. And that might explain, you might have been like, is that a typo? He spelled jailed in a really weird way. G-O-A-L-E-D, I think. Um, that's a British spelling, so there's some British stuff going on. But, um, he's... Uh, he, he's saying like there's no law that says that you're not allowed to attempt to swim the English Channel. But the fact that you're free to do it under those uh, rules of society doesn't mean that you're actually able to do it. 
So um, if you're able to do something, then you're free to do it. But that doesn't mean that if you're free to do it, then that you're actually able to do it. And he argues for this by saying, if this was wrong, if you weren't actually free to do things that you're forced to do, then um, this sort of scenario of uh, escaping coercion by restricting your own freedom would be unintelligible, and it is, in fact, intelligible. So he uses this example. Let's say you're being blackmailed to do something. So someone's pu pushing coercive force on you, trying to force you to do something that maybe you don't want to do. Like, let's say... Um, Let's say someone kidnaps my son and then says, uh, I'm not going to give you back your son unless you kill this person. And I'm just like, that's an impossible choice. Like, I don't I don't want to say no, but I also don't want to kill this person just to get my child back. Um, Cohen thinks, well, there's one escape that I could use. I could get myself arrested. <laughs> so once I'm in jail, I'm actually no longer able to uh, go and kill this person I'm being blackmailed to kill. Um, and so the blackmail loses its effect. Uh, they can't force me to do something I'm not actually free to do. That seems to make sense. Um, so this is one of the reasons why we should accept that if you're forced to do something, you must be free to do it. Now, this might all seem like a bunch of analytical hair splitting, like I said earlier, and why would we care? And this is the reason why we care in this debate, the reason why Cohen uh, bothers to even bring something like this up. Marxism the position he comes from, traditionally claims that capitalism is really a kind of slavery. It restricts freedom of laborers by forcing them to sell their labor in order to survive in the economy. So um, I don't know how much background you have with Marxism. I'm not planning on giving a whole big thing on Marxism uh, for this lecture, but it's interesting. I recommend exploring it, even if you disagree with it. It's definitely got a lot of things to say. Um, that are, are worth reflecting on, um, <clears throat> I think. But a lot of what Marx is saying is that uh, under capitalism, there are a few people, kind of like oligarchs, who control the means of production. They, co they control the basic economic engines of things. They control the, the land. They control the factories. All the things that, are, that enable people to generate economic value. And they um, and people, normal people, don't have access to that. They don't have that power and control. If you're not someone who controls the means of production, then the only way that you can make a living is by selling your labor. So you sell yourself to your company that you work for. And there's a lot of Marxist problems with this, um, but one of the big ones is that they think this is kind of coercive, that it's the... Um, it's the people who control the means of production. Let's just call them the oligarchs here for ease of reference. The oligarchs are holding all the cards, and they are able to, they, they, they're basically holding the keys to the economy, and everyone else is forced to trade with them. In many ways, um, this is like a scenario I've described before, um, where, like, say, um, I'm, uh, uh, it's a recession, economic recession, I own a factory, I have jobs. People want jobs. I can offer really low wages, and people will agree to work for me. Um, and that might seem uh, underhanded. It might seem like I'm restricting people's freedom or taking advantage of the situation and forcing them because they're really making – I'm putting them in a position of making a choice between working for unfair wages or starving. And that doesn't seem like a fair choice. That doesn't seem like a free society. Um, so Marxism oftentimes claims that – capitalism's um, uh, claims of being a free society is really just rhetoric and it's just another form of slavery and Cohen doesn't think that that's actually a very good argument he doesn't think that Marxists are on their best footing when they try to say that capitalism takes away people's freedom there's many reasons for thinking that capitalism gives you a bunch of freedom and uh, he wants to emphasize that um, Cohen is happy to grant to his capitalist opponents here that they do give you the ability to act. There, there is a difference between slavery and selling your labor on the free market. Um, they aren't exactly the same. Um, he talks about uh, like um, being denied a work permit. Um, if capitalism didn't offer any freedoms in the sense of empowering you to be able to do something, then how could we describe uh, what happens, what sort of loss of freedom is happening 
when, um, say, like uh, someone, uh, a foreigner is trying to get a work visa and they're denied. You know, there's something that they wanted to be able to do and denying them the work per permit doesn't allow them to do that. So that's a sign that there is some kind of freedom that capitalism provides um, that could be taken away under some circumstances. Um, so Cohen thinks if Marxism wants to say there is no freedom under capitalism, that that's just false. That's not the right way to think about it. Um, but the way he wants to kind of clarify this is that freedom and coercion are totally compatible. If we're talking about freedom in terms of uh, if you're forced to do something, then you're able to do it, and if you're able to do it, then you're free to do it, then if we want to say capitalism gives people freedom, it might still be that the Marxists have a point, that there is still coercion that could be uh, possible within that system, even if people are being given the freedom to decide you know, who they want to work for. They don't have, no one is chaining them to the machines at the factory. <clears throat> they can quit whenever they want. It's their free consent to agree to this arrangement. And that's a kind of freedom that Cohen thinks the Marxist, his own position, shouldn't overlook. And this is the first sign that Cohen's up to something different than what you're used to maybe seeing from Marxists and how he's kind of wanting to play on the capitalist's own terms in this debate. <clears throat> so at this point, if you're following along in my lecture notes, um, you can see that there's these two senses of freedom. One is about not being forced into doing something. And that's a sense of freedom that we probably still care about. Um, coercion here is still something maybe sensible and morally relevant. Um, but the, the sense of freedom that Cohen thinks we should use going forward here is this different sort of conception that puts the significance on what you are able and allowed to do and what you're not allowed to do. And this is specifically about actions. What actions are available to you as real choices and which ones are not? That's how we want to sort of talk about amounts of freedom uh, for Cohen. Okay, so being a slave would be um, a restriction of freedom. Um, that is taking the conventions around slavery, if you have them legally embodied and all this sort of stuff. Um, the slave does not is not given the kind of social clearance by this system to do certain actions. Um, they are really confined, and this is why we would say they are oppressed, because their freedom is being severely curtailed. And the same thing happens when you deny someone a work permit. You're taking an option away from them. Now, Cohen's not doing something like saying all restrictions on freedom are evil or something like that. Um, and in fact, he's going to be saying one of his major points in the paper is that there isn't a system of pure freedom. We'll, we'll talk about that. That's in the next step here. Um, but uh, he, he is trying to frame the debate here. So we're not, you're not getting any arguments just yet, but he's sort of clarifying his terms and setting this up. So Cohen wants to say, when laborers are strong-armed into selling their labor, like in this recession where I have the factory kind of example, they're still enjoying the freedoms of capitalism. And Cohen does, thinks there's no good reason to deny that. Um, that can be granted. Um, and that doesn't give away the whole argument. And it doesn't deal with any of the moral concerns we might have about coercion. Um, that's the, all that stuff's still on the table. It's just we have to grant that there is still a meaningful sense of freedom that we're talking about. Okay. Um, so that's step one here. How are you doing so far, Li Ling? Any questions popping up for you? I'm not hearing anything, um, so I, I hope everything is okay. Um, so uh, moving forward here, when we talk about freedom, when Cohen's going to use that word, he means um, freedom to act. And this is conditioned by the rules uh, and conventions of this system of social cooperation like we were talking about with Rawls and Nozick. I mean, if you think about um, – Nozick said this really uh, bluntly, I think in a very clear sort of way. He says – what you're entitled to do, what your entitlements are, um, is determined after we've got the conception of social justice that's appropriate. So once we figure out what would be a just social system, 
then we can determine what you're entitled to. And that's kind of what Cohen is saying here too. If you want to look at evaluating different social arrangements, you can look at them based on, if, you're, if you care about freedom, in terms of what those rules permit people in society to do and what they don't permit people to do. Okay, so here in the second movement, debunking a myth of both libertarians and their liberal opponents. So this is kind of going back to the traditional debate. In, in a kind of summary here for his arguments in this section, Cohen is saying that whether it's the libertarians or their social liberal opponents or socialists or any of this, in this debate between well-being and freedom, it's just sort of taken for granted. Everyone on both sides, regardless of what they agree and disagree, especially disagree about, they're sort of like both granting as a premise that if freedom was your the moral value you th thought ought to be prioritized, well, then clearly that speaks in favor of libertarians, that the libertarian position is the one that sort of uh, gives maximum protection for freedom. And that's something that Cohen wants to challenge. Uh, he doesn't think that that's actually true and that we shouldn't just grant that for the sake of argument moving forward here. Uh, he uses this definition from a philosophical dictionary uh, that was given by this philosopher named Few, Flew, who uh, defines libertarian such uh, uh, in this way. The wholehearted political and economic liberalism that is opposed to any social or legal constraints on individual freedom. <clears throat> so, um, when liberals want to attack libertarians, they say they try to a lot of times make arguments to say that well-being needs to take priority over certain types of liberty, and we already do this to a certain extent, and the socialist just thinks we should do it more. Um, but Cohen thinks that this is. Um, th this definition is sort of a question-begging definition. It's already granting that the libertarian position is the one that maximizes individual freedom. Okay, And he thinks this is a misuse of the concept of freedom. To say that um, the protection of private property from interference, which is what libertarians defend, they, they want small government, right? They don't want lots of government regulations in the markets, uh, the government telling people what to do with their money. They don't want high taxes, which is the government just taking your money and not allowing you to use it for what you want to use it for. Um, that this sort of position, this political position, would be the paradigm of pure freedom. No social or legal constraints on doing what you want with what you own. Private property. Okay? Cohen says that's a misuse of the concept of freedom. Um, this is uh, not only a question-begging definition, but it's a nonsensical definition for understanding what liberalism or libertarianism is actually committed to um, and what it means to um, endorse a social convention on private property. So if you remember way back at the beginning of the video, I said Cohen is going to be sort of getting us into big picture thinking about social justice again. And the target here is going to mostly revolve around the social convention of private property, which is something we can definitely take for granted. Um, the idea that ownership of property is like basic and a basic moral right. And I think Cohen does a good job showing how it's not as basic as we might believe it to be. And this is a big key part of the case he's making for that. So he says, if there were no constraints on people's freedom, that would actually be anarchy. And the protection of private property is not compatible with anarchy. Anarchy is like no social rules whatsoever. But Cohen's insight here is that if you want to protect private property, you have to buy in to social conventions. You do have to buy into constraints on people's freedom in order for private property to mean anything. So for, uh, he uses this example of camping in backyard. Um, if I own a house with the land, um, it's my private property in the, maybe the most literal way in which we use that phrase. Um, and you wanted to like come up and pitch a tent on my property. Um, that wouldn't be uh, acceptable. You'd be disrespecting my private property. Now you could ask me and I could say, yeah, that's okay with me, but all the power is given to me. It's only okay for you to pitch a tent on my land if I allow you to. If I don't allow you to, then it's wrong. That requires some kind of system of rules that say you're not allowed to do this. In order for private property to mean anything at all, in order for me to be given that kind of control over my land and what I want to do with it, requires obligations on everyone else that they can't do whatever they want with my land. Okay, so 
um, if I'm going to have a right to that property, everyone else is under an obligation. We've talked about this before with the idea of human rights, that rights always have as their flip side logically obligations. So if I have a right to life, then that means you have an obligation to not kill me unjustly. Um, similar thing here. If I have a right to my property, then that means everyone else is under an obligation not to screw with it, not to steal it, not to use it in ways that they want that are independent of what I consent to allow to have happen with my property. So um, a system of private property is constraining a lot of freedoms in the sense that we were talking about it earlier. The way in which the capitalist actually, the libertarian capitalist wants to define freedom, the ability to act. Um, we're playing on their home turf, not the Marxist conception of coercion or something like that, but on the grounds of what are you allowed to do? What are you empowered and enabled to do by the rules of those social conventions? Um, in order for private property to exist, a lot of people's freedom is going to be restricted. Now, that might be just so obvious. Why does it even need to be said, as I say here in the lecture notes? And um, Cohen is aware of this. He's, he doesn't think that he's like doing rocket science here. Um, <clears throat> but it turns out that much of the time, this point is forgotten. Um, Cohen says we take it for granted that the current norms that uh, protect the notion of private property are just so internalized. We, we take them for granted so deeply that we don't see those rules. They're kind of invisible to us. Um, this is very much like Werhein talking about how we internalize these mental models and then we don't necessarily see that there was a choice here. And that, that's why I like, that's what I was saying earlier about why I love getting into this debate because it's so easy to, like I, I think I said this in my la last lecture on Nozick, maybe at the beginning about the whole reason for doing this unit um, and kind of like the takeaway of what I wanted you to get out of Rawls and, and this whole thing is to recognize that you don't have to accept the, the sort of existence of society as a given. Um, there's choices here, and we've made choices in the past, and we're stuck with our choices now in some ways, but there are other choices that we could have made and we could make in the future. I mean, we could set things up in a different way than how we have them right now. If there's problems with it, we can rethink those basic assumptions, the basic foundations on which our society is constructed. Um, and that's what Cohen, I think, is trying to call our attention to. Even if you think this is justified, recognize that you've made a choice, and it's a choice to restrict people's freedom everyone's freedom in certain ways in order to protect this idea of private property. Um, so that just needs to be acknowledged. I really like, um, personally, I really like the part where Cohen says, in many ways, um, these rules might be invisible to people who have a lot of property or who are middle class or something like that, or upper class, much less. But if you're in the lower class, then these sort of restrictions on what you're not allowed to do because it's someone else's property are like painfully obvious to you. I think that's a very insightful kind of um, sociological point about this. We might take for granted uh, private property rights, but that's probably because we're thinking about all the things that we have that we want to be able to use in the way we want to use them. People who don't have anything or have very little are like constantly being reminded of these fences, right? I might not be interested in using your property if my property is good enough to satisfy the things I want to be able to do in my life, um, I'm not worried about the fact that like, oh, I, I'm not allowed to use your lawnmower because you own it. But that's fine. I got my own lawnmower. So it's it's not very salient to me that there's this kind of restriction on my freedom that I can't use your lawnmower. But if I have no lawnmower and I'm like looking around at everyone else's lawnmowers and I'm like, oh, I really wish I had a lawnmower right now, then it's really obvious to me that I'm not allowed, that there that these rules of society under capitalism and free markets and private property don't allow me to use everyone else's lawnmowers. Okay, so that's one point. Um, second point, Cohen thinks that we also, um, oh, 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 and I want to say something else. Um, this identification of private property with pure freedom, like no regulations, that is language that you hear people using a lot, especially libertarians, especially in the political arena. When they're arguing for their position, they're saying, when they're talking about um, small government, um, what Cohen would want to say to them is like, look, you're not saying no government. Um, you're saying you want small government when it comes to these other kinds of regulations, but look at all the regulations that you need to endorse 
in order to make a system of private property actually work. And that's no small potatoes. That's exactly the kind of the issues on which Cohen is going to try to make his case for how socialism and straight up communism actually are going to give people more freedom than capitalism will. And that's where this is all kind of headed. Um, if you've read the paper, you know <clears throat> this is where he's going with this. Um, okay, so <clears throat> second point. So if we're not careful about this, then we might be uh, we might fall for the rhetorical trick here of just thinking that the libertarian position of private property uh, with no regulations on it is uh, a system of no system when it isn't. It really isn't. Um, okay, so. <clears throat> Second point that he wants to make about why it's important to say this, even though it's so obvious, is the way in which we can moralize freedom here. So what do we mean by moralizing it? Well, he's saying that we might, and he gives some examples of people who kind of talk this way, uh, intellectuals who, who talk in this debate in these sorts of terms that he thinks is kind of inappropriate, that we might think about freedom as being violated only when an unjust interference occurs and otherwise assume a moral justification for private property. So in other words, um, there's no restriction on my freedoms um, until I do something unjust. So uh, like for exa example, if I steal from you, well now there's a problem, right? Now a freedom has been violated when I violate your private property rights. But we're not recognizing that there's, there is a freedom that's being negated. There's a, an ability to act that's being denied by just having private property at all. Okay, So um, this would say that, well, there isn't a problem with private property and freedom because by freedom we're only worried about these unjust arrangements, taking for granted that private property is something morally just. Um, and Cohen thinks that definition is just not helpful. Um, it would basically say that as long as a restriction on your ability to act is not unjust, it's not violating your freedom. But that would entail, logically, that criminals in jail are not having their freedom being taken away, which is absurd. Um, to say that the criminal is actually free while they're in jail is like, no, no, that's not, that's not right. And we can still talk about, I mean, he's not saying that uh, imprisoning people is unjust or something. But he's just saying this way of talking about it is kind of absurd. So we shouldn't think this way. The other thing, and this is really where the, the main objection I think that Cohen offers here that really hits home on why this sort of moralized definition of freedom um, is not going to be satisfactory, is that it's presupposing, it's taking for granted that private property rights are justified. Um, it's begging the question on this. It's a circular kind of argument. As soon as the libertarian wants to say, the reason why property rights are justified is because it promotes freedom. If we're already building into the conception of freedom the assumption that private property rights are just, then that's a circular argument. You're assuming exactly what you're trying to prove. And Cohen's like, yeah, that's a just buddies, libertarians over there, not the best way for you to argue. You're going to make yourself into just a circular argument. And I think Cohen's got a, some good friendly advice, charitable advice to his opponent here. If you really want to defend libertarianism, you don't want to undercut what is one of the maybe strongest arguments in your in, in available to you for justifying private property that it does promote people's freedom it's definitely like Warhain said a step up from slavery and feudalism and that has to be acknowledged and Cohen wants to say like yeah don't take away one of your best arguments he still thinks his opponents are wrong here but he's trying to give him the benefit of the doubt and try to give him the strongest possible argument. He doesn't. He, I think Cohen does a really, really good job trying to be careful not to straw man his capitalist opponent here. And this is this is really good evidence for it. This argument that he gets into here, this little dialectic. Okay. So with that tangent kind of off to the side, um, let's get into um, the the next big step of the argument here, that Cohen is happy to grant that capitalism does protect freedom. But there might be a way that um, the libertarian might want to um, sort of restrict this a little bit. So to say, well, the kind of freedom that we're really interested in talking about here is economic freedom. Okay? Um, but that Cohen doesn't think that's going to get you pure freedom either. So in other words, um, The, liber the libertarian might try to say, 
that look the restrictions that private property rights give like how everyone else can't steal your stuff is not really um, restricting um, and this is a different type of freedom restriction what um, private property rights enable is your freedom to buy and sell things without private property you wouldn't get those rights private property makes that possible and Cohen is happy to say, yep, yeah, that's the type of activity um, that capitalism does get you. But he wants us to think about this more carefully. Um, there might be other things that we care about calling freedom, not just this economic freedom to the ability to buy and sell things on a market. Um, what Cohen's going to be kind of arguing for in this section is that the going back to our original definition of freedom, he thinks the kind of freedom that we care about is the freedom that allows us to do things the kind of actions that we're allowed to do that's the sense of freedom it's a little bit more universal it includes things like actions of buying and selling but includes a lot of other things too like use of resources um, for example um, if there's a public park in my neighborhood um, I am able to go to the park and swing on the swings go down the slide I've been doing this with my kid all the time right it's a it's a there's a play structure for my kid to play on that I'm able to use. I don't own it, so I can't buy and sell the park on the market, right? It's not my land, it's not my play structure, so I'm not given those freedoms. But there's other freedoms to act that this public property, not private property, but public pop property, enables me to enjoy. And that's a kind of freedom that Cohen wants included in the discussion here when we're weighing would socialism or communism or capitalism, this kind of free market capitalism, which one's going to give you more freedom? He wants to be including anything that's in the category of what we're enabled to do, that that's the kind of freedom that we care about. The libertarian opponent might be trying to restrict the conversation here to just economic freedom. Because under communism or with public property, um, I am not permitted the freedom of buying and selling things on the market. That's an action I'm not allowed to do, like in my example with the, the park in my neighborhood. Um, with private property, then I am able to buy and sell things. So maybe that's a cool freedom to have. This economic freedom is that libertarianism is the purest system for preserving this kind of economic freedom, the freedom to buy and sell things on the market. But even there, Cohen's not convinced. Um, first off, he says economic freedom is either going to be involving the freedom to use goods and services or it doesn't. Okay, so if if economic if we're going to define economic freedom in terms of being able to use goods and services, then capitalism restricts um, freedom as much as it grants it. So if you've got a play structure on your in your yard on your property, I'm not allowed to go and use it. I can use the public park, but I can't use your private pu private park in your backyard um, to have my kid play on your play structure, or swing on your swings, or something like that. So by giving you the ability to use those resources, it's denying everyone else if it's private property. But he says maybe the maybe the opponent's not going to buy that though. Okay, so maybe they want to say uh, economic freedom. We're not going to define that way. It's not going to involve the use of resources or or services. Um, but we're really going to restrict it to just this buying and selling on the market. Well, then Cohen says there still is restriction on freedom, economic freedom under libertarianism. I can't sell your things, duh, and I'm limited by my money. Even if I'm allowed to engage in the market and buy and sell things on the market, that depends on what resources I have. Um, and he says um, this, is, this means you're going to get a freedom of degrees based on um, how difficult it is for you to arrange to be able to make this transaction. I really like this example of Say I want to buy a ticket to go see a show. Now, I'm free to buy this ticket. No one is telling me that this ticket is unavailable for my purchase, but I still need to have the money for it. And what I have to do to get that money might be greater or less. I might have more uh, options available to me or less, depending on how much money I have. If I have almost no money, then maybe I'd have to do something like sell my bicycle to have the money to be able to buy uh, that ticket, whereas someone else is just like, oh yeah, I've got all this money sitting in the bank, I'll just spend some of that, right? M not as big of a deal. So there's freedom of degrees here based on um, what I would need to do to be able to enjoy that freedom or to exercise that freedom.
And and I like this uh, quote from from Cohen to kind of push that argument home. He says it's scarcely intelligible that one should be interested in how much freedom people have in a certain form of society without being interested in how readily they are able to exercise it. So, for example, it'd be weird for me to be like, oh, I'm so happy that this free market uh, capitalism in America gives me the freedom to buy and sell anything, but I have no money. So if I'm poor and I'm sitting around being like, I do not have the means to buy anything, but it's still I can enjoy the theoretical options that this society gives me. I mean, Cohen is basically saying that's really cold comfort. That's not really going to satisfy. And he says, uh, to kind of, again, put the nail in the coffin here for this suggestion that when we talk about economic freedom, we're only talking about the ability, the uh, option to buy and sell things. He says, why would we care about that? Why would I want to buy or sell anything unless it would give me access to goods and services? That's what it's all about. We kind of talked about this before way back at the beginning of the quarter um, when we were talking about uh, means versus ends, like valuing something uh, instrumentally versus valuing it intrinsically. And we talked about money a lot. Money doesn't seem to be an intrinsic value. It's not something valuable for its own sake. It's valuable for what I can get out of it. How, What sorts of goods and services does having that money enable me to enjoy using the system of society that in that uses currency right um so that's a that's another thing is like this suggestion that just the buying and selling itself is this super valuable kind of freedom he doesn't buy that argument he thinks this is ultimately going to terminate in what actual resources goods and services do i have access to in the society and that's a way we're going to start thinking about freedom that's sort of the Again, the definition of freedom that Cohen wants to use moving forward here in comparing socialism and communism with capitalism. Okay. All right. So we're making good progress here in sort of setting up the argument. Um, and we, we're pretty much done with the setup. Um, and now we're actually going to get into the actual argument. So all, everything that Cohen's been doing so far has been laying the groundwork for the ultimate argument he wants to provide, which is that um, communism, communal property or public property, a system of that gives you more freedom than a system of private property. So on the libertarians' own terms, on their own moral values, uh, Cohen thinks communism can do better than capitalism. Um, I would just want to check in one more time with Li Ling. How are you doing at this uh, juncture in the lecture? We're kind of at the halfway part. Are you there? Oh, it looks like she left the chat. Uh, bummer. Okay, so I'm just talking to myself. <laughs> Alrighty. Um, okay, well then I will keep going here. All right, sorry for the little break in the video. I was just taking a little short break halfway through the lecture. So let's get back into it. Um, yeah, it's still just me. Okay. <laughs> um, so, at this point in the argument, I was saying um, Cohen has kind of like laid down the foundations for how we're framing this debate. And the key thing going forward here is that when we're trying to figure out which system for society is going to give us more freedom, this is going to be understood in terms of what that social system allows me to do, what it gives me the freedom to be able to do, uh, freedom in this sort of sense. Um, freedom of action. Okay, so if we're starting to now try to uh, compare how much freedom we get between capitalist systems and socialist social systems, um, Cohen makes a very interesting distinction here that I, I think is really important to keep in mind. I'm really happy that it's on his radar. Um, in my experiences uh, arguing with Marxists, um, a lot of times um, the debate sort of happens on this really abstract theoretical level. And there's something to that, and Cohen's going to say there's something to that. But there's also this kind of way in which we got to always think about these arguments um, for these social systems in the context of a particular society with particular circumstances and particular situations. This is very, very, very similar to what Warhane was saying too. I, Warhane keeps coming back up here, and it's 
maybe not an accident because of um, the subject matter of what we're talking about here. Remember, Werhain was saying that like this theoretical model of capitalism needs to always be sort of um, uh, made more subtle. We have to be a little bit more aware of the circumstances that we're applying that model within. And that's these kind of two levels, what uh, Cohen calls the formal and the abstract, and the, on the other hand, the concrete, the circumstantial. So he says, in some ways, it's almost impossible to really make a measurement of what gives you more freedom in this kind of formal, abstract, theoretical level. Um, he, he mentions actually in the, in the article that when he was writing this paper, uh, when he, some of the early drafts, he was actually proposing a system, a theoretical system for how to measure amounts of freedom. But he said uh, there was a lot of objections that he got for it and it didn't seem satisfactory. Uh, so he's leaving it out. Um, but he's still, still sort of like, he's like, I'm working on it. And he says, I, I hope that people do continue to think about that, to try to figure out how could we sort of gauge amounts of freedom in the more th on the more theoretical level here. In some ways, what he's going to do in the next section is going to be um, somewhat in that level, but, but also grounded. But I really, really like the um, analogy he uses here with the Jeep um, and talking about, like, which cars go faster. So you might be tempted to think, um, well, we should gauge the speed of cars in terms of their raw horsepower or something like that, like a Jeep versus a sports car. Sports car goes faster. But he's like, there's no way in which you can really think about the speed of the car in a vacuum. It always depends on the driving conditions. Um, on the freeway, the sports car is going to go faster than the Jeep. But off-road, the Jeep's going to go faster than the sports car. <laughs> like The sports car is going to go maybe nowhere. Um, the suspension is not good enough and this kind of thing, right? It's just going to bump along and the Jeep is going to go. So he says, uh, we're always thinking about this in terms of under certain conditions, something is maybe going to produce more freedom than another model under those same conditions. But which concrete circumstances should we be paying attention to? And he says, well, it really depends. I can't give you, um, it, Cohen says, I can't give you this kind of like absolute metric for it. But we do know about the metric of freedom to act. And that's what it's going to come down to. So he thinks we're sooner or later we are going to have to start talking about concrete circumstances. And this is where he throws another very interesting card into the mix, especially if we're thinking about socialism in an American context uh, with American culture and American society and people's values and this sort of thing. He says one of the biggest circumstances that would affect whether a certain social system will give more freedom is what people believe will give them more freedom. So he says, uh, I'm just going to read here straight from my lecture notes because it's perfect. Um, a socialist revolution, like Marxist revolution kind of stuff, won't make people more free if the people who are being liberated do not believe it will. And this is definitely probably what's going on in America. Um, like I was saying earlier, public sentiment, cultural sentiment about socialism is... Uh, it's in some ways it might be changing right now, but definitely historically there's been a pretty strong lean against it. Now you've got people like Bernie Sanders going around and like drumming up support for socialism in a much more robust way than probably it's ever been talked about in American politics for a very long time. Um, maybe not even to the back of um, like socialism in the communist revolutions happening at the early 20th century. Maybe not since then. Um, but this will, will have an effect. Um, and he says, if you wanted to make any sort of change, like a Marxist revolution, where um, the people take control of the means of production away from these oligarchs, anytime you've got some sort of political, economic, social transformation going on, there are going to be these temporary restrictions on freedom to make it happen. And that's a cost that he's not willing to just dismiss and, and brush by. Like, oh, well, this will be all better once it's all over kind of thing, which is a line you often get from Marxists. Um, and this, I think, is uh, more credit to Cohen that he's uh, taking the concerns of his opponents seriously here and really not trying to just dismiss their concerns, um, but address them uh, full on and, and recognize them and acknowledge them. So um, he does say that these are factors that do have to be taken into consideration. But he also says this. Um, 
this doesn't mean that the concrete is the only thing that's of value here, as if the formal or abstract or theoretical evaluation is useless. And the big argument he offers on behalf of why this more like universal thinking, kind of like think think like um, Rawls's veil of ignorance. It's not a circumstance we're actually in um, to like make ourselves ignorant of our social position and this kind of thing. It's just an idealistic theoretical model, right? Um, but it might still be helpful in informing what how we're going to navigate the circumstances that we're faced with. He says the danger if we don't do this at all, if we never think outside of the box, or we don't think in this in these sort of theoretical terms is that we would always then be prisoners of the dominant culture. So uh, what Cohen talks about is the status quo. Um, he says, uh, if you confuse the theoretical with the concrete, um, that's just handing the game over to the status quo. And it seems like it is appropriate for us to rethink the things, uh, the circumstances of our current social arrangement that there might be need for progress, that improve upon these, that we shouldn't maybe just settle with what we've got kind of thing. So he says, and these are my, this is my language, but um, whatever you think of these positions, um, we do need to keep dreaming. We do need to kind of think about them in these more expanded ways in which philosophers love to talk about things, like on this universal sort of level. Like if we could just rewrite society, what would be the right way to do it? Now, eventually, at some point, that kind of a cool big idea is going to have to degenerate into the hard work of dealing with practical circumstances. But Cohen thinks it does offer some kind of insight and guidance. So both are going to be important. He's not being reductive here one way or the other. Um, this is really interesting in from a historical pr perspective, like in terms of the philosophical tradition and all this kind of stuff. Um, uh, so I wanted to give you like maybe a little clue in on, on what's happening here. Um, and I'm going to have to make some generalizations here to make it manageable. But a lot of times in the intellectual traditions um, around uh, socialism and communism and Marxism, there's been this kind of um, sometimes more or less veiled um, um, theoretical account of kind of relativism that um, under the existing culture, everything gets redefined to reinforce the status quo. Um, if you've ever heard the word cultural hegemony, that's what these people who throw around that term and are talking about that phenomenon, that's what they have in mind. So that the whole idea of there being a universal truth actually gets in the way of any kind of progressive social change. For these thinkers, for these theorists, and a lot of them are Marxists, um, everything is about the circumstances. Everything is about the contingencies, and there isn't this kind of big universal thing. So probably one of the, the thinkers I've got most in mind here is a philosopher named Foucault, who is a very famous postmodernist uh, philosopher uh, who also shares a lot of sympathies with Marxist ideas. And he says there is no way to talk about justice in a way that's free from bourgeois uh, sensibilities or these kinds of uh, capitalist um, mindsets, the mental models of capitalism, to go back to use Warhain's language. Um, but Cohen doesn't take that route. So he, again, bucks the trend here in terms of um, how Marxism gets defended by saying that there is some purpose here to talking about um, things in the abstract that are independent of the contingencies of circumstances. Um, again, to bring back Warhain here, what Cohen is proposing in this fourth section of the paper is maybe very similar to um, the kind of mixed um, pluralistic mode that um, that Werhain had in mind, like recognizing that maybe capitalism, and she's arguing for capitalism, right, that capitalism offers some objective moral benefit, um, but that it still has to be interfaced with contingent circumstances. Um, that kind of dialogue between the sort of universal values and these more specific circumstances, I think is maybe not exactly the same as what Cohen's going for, but very, very similar here, that he thinks there's something to both levels of analysis and you can't just ditch one and only do the other. So that's really interesting, I think, in terms of the 
bigger picture intellectual discussion that this involved. By the way, I mean, this discussion that we've done with social and economic justice is part of a huge, massive conversation. This is just like the tip of the iceberg of it. Um, but hopefully it, it gets your feet wet and you get some idea for um, what matters in this debate and, and maybe sorting out some of your own uh, intuitions and perspectives. Helping you locate yourself in this conversation and giving you some language, some conceptual language for being able to articulate that. Okay, so section five is where the rubber really meets the road for Cohen's grand argument for this whole paper. This is kind of the culmination of it. Um, so he's going to say, socialist and capitalist models are competing with each other over offering the same kind of freedom. So he thinks, again, sometimes in the way that this conversation usually goes, that there are different types of freedom um, that are set off against each other. There's this kind of individualistic freedom of doing what I want with my property versus the freedom to have uh, a life free from instability or the threat of poverty and my inability to live a meaningful life or to pursue happiness, this kind of stuff. Um, and Cohen thinks that's just not the right way to talk about it. He thinks it, it would be kind of, um, mm, what's the best word here? Um, not quite insincere. Um, it wouldn't be charitable. That definitely is true, I think Cohen would say. It isn't charitable or even accurate to characterize capitalism as slavery, to treat that as morally, to, to treat the capitalistic system of uh, laborers being exploited for the sake of profit uh, for the people who own companies or own the means of production, that it isn't right to equate that directly with slavery. They're not the same thing. Um, there is a kind of freedom that capitalist pro capitalism provides. And Cohen thinks if socialism is going to be able to defend itself, if it's going to be able to justify itself here, then it has to be able to show how it can do a better job than capitalism of providing the same kind of freedoms, namely freedom qua or in terms of the ability to act what actions are available for you to take okay so um to put this in a negative way if, if the positive way is that cohen's thinking to defend socialism i need to show that it's providing all these kinds of freedoms in a better way than capitalism does but also he wants to say negatively that capitalism does not provide the kind of freedom that it promises um, and that's that's going back to these kinds of reflections from earlier in the paper where he said capitalism is restricting freedom as much as it's granting freedom. The person who owns the property is given all this freedom under those rules, but everyone else is denied access. Okay, so to make this case, he uses some toy examples. And I want to say something else here on behalf of him. In exploring these examples, um, I was actually talking about this with my landlord or my the building manager for my apartment building before I gave this lecture tonight. Um, and and he was kind of curious. He's actually a pretty hardcore libertarian. Um, and he, he was just he was being friendly and being like, hey, what are you up to? And I was like, I'm getting ready for this lecture. And he's like, oh, what are you what are you gonna be lecturing on? And I told him <laughs> socialism, Marxism. And he was like, oh, really? And he's like, well, lay it on me. So I, I gave him kind of the nutshell version of this whole talk. And he was like, well, is Cohen cherry picking his examples here? And I think that's a fair concern. Um, I think Cohen would say that's a fair concern. Um, in sort of getting into his arguments here, I don't think Cohen is saying, look at these little examples where I can show you that communism gives you more freedom than private property. Communal property gives more freedom than private property. Therefore, everything should be communally owned. It should all be public instead of private, um, something like that. I don't think Cohen is going to go for that. And why? Because of what he said in the last section. He's like, you got to look at it circumstance by circumstance. But if you want to see like how can communism um, make a case for itself here, some examples might be helpful to illustrate the general dynamics. How we scale up from these examples to bigger social systems, um, to society at large, especially when you're imagining a country as large as America, um, there's going to be some difficulties there. And I don't think that Cohen is um, sort of thinking he's got some quick argument here that's going to settle the whole mess. I think he is very cognizant of how complicated this issue is and how it does need to be taken um, carefully. But So my recommendation is to look at his arguments in this section as illustrations of what the communist or the Marxist has to say for themselves and the kinds of concerns that it has around capitalism. 
and that these are reasonable things that are going to populate this conversation as we're looking at it in a case-by-case -case basis. They're the kinds of values and considerations that will inform our evaluation of more specific instances. Um, I actually think, uh, and knowing some of the stuff I know about Cohen's writing elsewhere, that um, uh, he's not completely opposed to private property in total. There might be some things that private property is more appropriate for than communal property. Um, one example I like is, uh, imagine we are at uh, an office and I have uh, this photograph of my grandmother that I put on my desk. I think Cohen would say, totally fine that that is yours and yours alone, that you have complete domination of that object and you can decide everything that happens with it. It's not like if you're in the cubicle next to me, you're like, hey, when am I going to get my timeshare with that picture of your grandmother? Right? That just doesn't make any sense. That's not a, it's not a freedom you want anyway. Um, so it's kind of fine uh, for me to have complete control of that. Or say like my toothbrush. It's okay if we all have our own toothbrushes or something like that. Um, so uh, Cohen's not going to go to this absurd route of everything. Um, but there's some big opportunities, he thinks, for making certain things communally held rather than privately held that's going to expand our freedoms in society. So he uses this case example, uh, the dudes and the tools. Um, so he says, I'm not going to lay out the whole, well, maybe I'll do a brief recap here, but hopefully you've already read the paper so you know what I'm talking about. He says, let's say I've got some tools, you've got some tools, they're different, and um, I, want, I would love to have access to the kinds of tools that you have and vice versa. So let's put our tools in some communal area, like we live maybe on the same block or something, and we'll have a little like uh, receptacle where we put the tools, and we might keep track of like whose they were originally. I mean, the system he sort of sets up is sort of this modified private property. Um, it's not complete private property because there's kind of open access about this. But he says, um, let's have this system set up where if there's a tool there in the communal area in that box, um, anyone, it, let's say it's, it was originally your tool, and I go in there, and I'm like, I'm going to use this tool. I take the tool from it. I go over to my house, um, you know, use the tool. I bring it back and put it there. I'm, I'm allowed to get access to the object until I'm done using it. So I've, I've used it for what I want to use it for, or you need to use it, whichever one comes first. So even in that system, that's not total communism. Cohen is still allowing in that illustration that um, the person who sort of, there, there is maybe some privileged access that one person has over the other, but that's still a different from a complete private property sort of arrangement. Um, I don't have to go over and ask you, can I borrow your tool whenever? If it's just there, I can just go and take it. And then maybe you're like, oh, I, hey, Tim, I was planning on using that tool. Um, I'm going to come over and take it. And I'm like, okay, that's fair. That's what we set up as the rules for what people are allowed to do. Under this system, you and I both have more freedom in terms of being able to do things with the tools than we had on the original arrangement in which it was just private property, your tools and my tools. So Cohen's thinking maybe things like that could happen more. Um, things like public parks. He uses the example of ownership of pavements is public property, right? Um, or things like public schools. All of those things are things we already kind of recognize are better if they are communally held rather than if they're all private property. And he's thinking maybe we can expand that a little bit more um, and we'd get more freedom in the process. Okay, so maybe he's got a point there that in terms of freedom as the ability to do things that I want to do, um, communally held or uh, properties or sort of uh, attenuated or, or qualified private property starts opening up more freedoms for everybody than if everything is private property. Um, he doesn't make this argument, but I, I like to add this efficiency argument to it too, because oftentimes capitalism likes to pride itself on being more efficient. Um, I always love this example. This one's always kind of rung true for me. Um, imagine we live on a, like a suburban street, and in a lot of suburban streets, like everyone has their own lawnmower. Every single house in the garage is a lawnmower. That's really inefficient. Not we don't always, we don't need to have our own lawnmower. We could have maybe a few lawnmowers that we are that are communally held, 
and uh, we set up arrangements about when uh, people get to use um, that lawnmower. Um, and these these systems can be as flexible and as complicated as we want to make them to make sure that everyone has uh, as much as possible more free access to this thing. But I'm not planning on using my lawnmower 24 hours a day, seven days a week. That's just not a plan. Um, maybe if there's a person who wants to have that kind of freedom, we can start talking and negotiating about how that could be possible. And we might do things like thinking about how could that person make other contributions to our communal arrangement that would be justifiable or equitable for giving them this kind of uh, one of the lawnmowers that's completely at their disposal. Um, there's definitely ways in which this can be set up. It doesn't have to be like everyone only gets the equal share. And this is when there's a lot of like straw man versions of communism out there that don't um, sort of recognize that there can be more complicated versions of this. Same way as capitalism can get uh, straw man too by saying that if, in order that if we're going to evaluate capitalism, we can only look at our like dysfunctional capitalism that we currently enjoy or don't enjoy, as the case may be. There might be more morally um, acceptable versions of capitalism uh, than others. And that, that's the same thing going on with communism, too. We've got to um, make sure that we're giving it the best run for the money that we possibly can. And that's some of what Cohen is going to do here with the arguments we're about to explore next. He's, again, trying to charitably look at the arguments his opponent can offer. Okay, so let's say it's granted, for the sake of argument, that certain things being communally held gives everyone more freedom, more access to actions that they want to do, enables them to do actions that they want to do more than a strict private property system. Okay, but maybe the libertarian can say, yeah, but private property ownership is still the only example of full freedom, right? If we're going to hold things communally, I get some access to it, but I don't have complete control of that object. I don't have complete freedom with the tools to do what, what I want whenever I want. Okay, so in, in having communally held things, we have to work with other people. Yeah, maybe we can set up more elaborate and flexible systems of sharing that is going to make sure everyone's sort of getting what they want, but there's that has to be negotiated too. Uh, I don't get the ability to unilaterally, unilaterally make decisions with regard to certain objects or opportunities. Okay, so I can't do everything that I want. Um, uh, so, but if I, if we have, if it's my property, private property under this kind of capitalist model, then that does give me complete control over the object. And that's maybe more freedom with regard to that object. Here's how Cohen wants to respond. Problem one for this proposal. This may not matter, he says. He says, whatever advantage I could get from full freedoms might be outweighed by an increasing number of partial freedoms. So it's kind of like if I'm choosing between these two systems of private property or communally held things, um, under the communal system, with any particular object, I don't have as much freedom as I might have under private property if I owned it. But on the whole, I've got more access because it's not just about the things that I initially had, but all the things you have too that we're now putting together in this communal arrangement. Kind of imagine if... Um, a number of houses on this suburban street that I'm dreaming up decided to become a little commune. And they're like, look, we got all these, everyone's got all these different things. Let's put them in, let's put them in this kind of shared access area. Um, then maybe uh, the increased access of partial freedoms uh, with regard to these things could make up for uh, the loss of full freedom that I have with regard to any particular object. Okay, so that's one, con that's one way in which this might not be preferable. The, why liber the, the capitalist model of private property may not be preferable to the communistic one. But here's another deeper point that he says. Problem number two. He says it smells of bourgeois materialism. And this is getting into kind of deeper philosophical territory from the Marxist universe. Um, but this kind of capitalistic model of freedom, of like total domination of an object, um, seems to see freedom as attached specifically to material objects. And materialism has always been a kind of concern of Marxists about capitalist systems, that it, it's kind of dehumanizing, that it's restricting value to just objects as opposed to other kinds of objects of, or uh, I don't want to say objects, but not material objects, but other values that we might care about, especially relational ones and human dignity and things like that. Um, the, uh, 
it, he says, um, if we're thinking about freedom, the way we've been talking about this whole time, freedom to act, what you're able to do, then that's a lot bigger than just control of material things. Um, and why would we want that? Right? He, that, that's kind of the argument that he leaves us with is why would we want to have this kind of total control? He says we, we're sort of maybe fetishizing that is kind of inappropriately or inordinately um, attaching more significance to domination of material things rather than reminding ourselves that why we would care about having any of that access to that material thing anyway is about what we want to do with it. So imagine like um, the tool case again where you know, on one level, I might value the tool I own because what it allows me to do. Maybe I can fix my lawnmower because I have these tools, uh, or I can paint my fence or something like that. But I also might value it by like, sort of like, it's mine. Um, I'm always thinking of uh, Golem from Lord of the Rings, like, it's my own, my precious. Like, all I care about is just having it, that it gives me comfort to know that I at any point, I can go to my garage and use that tool whenever I want to. I don't want to do it right now, so I don't choose to. But I like having that power. And in some ways, Cohen is challenging that kind of feeling or that kind of value of being like, is that really what this is all about? Is it really just about the comfort of having that total access? Um, how much do we really need to care about that? Um, Something that is always kind of in the back of my mind, again, to kind of put this into uh, uh, context, is is the way we kind of deal with children when children are playing with each other. And children definitely, at certain ages, uh, show like a marked attachment to certain objects. And uh, maybe you've seen this, if you've dealt with like mixed company kids before, I'm sure you've encountered the situation. Like a kid is visiting another kid's house, and a kid has all these toys, right? And they're ignoring them. They're like, those toys are not interesting to them. But as soon as the kid that's visiting like goes and shows interest with that toy, now the kid is like, oh, now I want that toy. I'm going to take it away from you because that's my toy, right? Where it's like, they weren't going to do anything with it anyway. So, you know, why does it, why not share? And when it comes to children, we usually try to encourage sharing. And I think Colin's trying to remind us of, of that kind of intuition of like, what do we really care to have ownership for? It's really just that access. That access can be compatible with other people having access to it. So we can kind of detach ourselves a little bit from this fetishized materialistic control of things and rem remind ourselves about the values that are really deeper about why any of that access would matter at all. So I think that's, that's another very interesting argument that he puts in here. The Buddhist in me starts getting really excited about these arguments. I don't know if you share some of those intuitions, but there's definitely some deeper stories here, and I, I'm happy that he Cohen throws that into the mix. Again, this is not some kind of conclusive, absolute, knockdown, silver bullet argument that Cohen is providing. I think the right way to take all these arguments is these are considerations that are going to be relevant when we start thinking about should we have a communal system or a private property system with regard to any particular situation. Okay. Again, think back to my example about my picture of my grandma or my toothbrush. Okay, um, sometimes total domination might be relevant, and in which case, maybe it should be respected. Uh, and it's not unacceptable or inappropriate to do so. But maybe with other things it is. And that's what Cohen's trying to, he's trying to raise that question. Um, incidentally, um, yeah, I'm going to go on a, one more tangent here before the final section. Um, there's a book, I think I might have mentioned it before. Um, I still have it over here. Uh, Michael Sandel's got this book, What Money Can't Buy, and uh, it's not a it's not a like full on condemnation of capitalism by any stretch of the imagination, but it is uh, definitely. I mean, and Sandel says as much. He's like, I'm not offering a whole lot of conclusions here, but I'm trying to raise some philosophical questions that we could ask about the moral limits of markets. Basically, what should be allowed to be bought and sold freely on the market. Um, there's some really blatant, obvious examples like human trafficking, um, and that might be because of how human trafficking interferes with people's basic freedom to do what they want with their life, basic autonomy, things like that. But Sandal goes into a bunch of uh, interesting um, particular cases about things that maybe we don't want to buy and sell. One of his favorite topics is cues, like jumping the line um, by paying more money. Uh, this happens at Disney World, I think, 
where there's like a special line that if you pay more, you get easier access to rides. Uh, or this happens a lot with um, airplanes, um, that you can buy an upgraded ticket, which allows you to skip the line, this kind of thing. And he's like, he thinks, uh, Sandal kind of is like, is that really a good thing? Maybe it degrades some of the um, moral virtues of existing in a society or a basic recognition of people uh, uh, that they're of their moral worth and the, the worth of their lives, that people who have more money are not somehow morally more worthy than other people, um, these kinds of things. Again, no hard and fast conclusions here, but Sandal's trying to say like, hey, these are things worth considering. And I think that's what Cohen, that's similar to what Cohen's doing here. He's saying, here are some moral concerns that would be relevant when we're considering any particular resource or service and asking, do we want this to be private or public? Um, okay, so final section. Again, Cohen using some charity here on behalf of his opponents. He says, okay, so imagine for the opponent here, um, the like libertarian capitalist defender saying, okay, fair enough. You know, let's, let's just say they grant, you know, Cohen his arguments here. They're like, you got some good points here, Cohen, in favor of communism, but you know, maybe we don't have to go all the way to communism here to solve these problems. Um, because even if I don't, you know, I've got my ownership of my things and I don't have access to other people's things because uh, that's their property, there's still freedom here. There's a means by which I can gain access to things that I don't own through the market, through making market transactions. If I really care about that, then I can, um, you know, decide to sacrifice certain things by selling them to get the money to be, gain access to the other things that I want. So there's this kind of um, way I can extend my economic freedoms through making uh, rational contracts with other people for mutual benefit. Again, as a classic thing that capitalism is used as a moral argument on its behalf, it goes all the way back to Hasnas, if you remember way back with the debate around fiduciary duty of the kind of moral significance of freedom through contracts, through freely associated market transactions. So you don't need socialism to get those benefits of increased access. And um, Cohen has kind of two ways of responding to this. One, he says, he admits is a little weak. Um, so he says, uh, I'm just going to read the quote here. Uh, Life under capitalism, he thinks, tends to generate an irrationally strong attachment to purely private use of purely private property, which can lead to a neglect of mutually gainful and freedom expanding options through sharing behaviors, communal property, that kind of thing. So he, it, this is kind of going back to the attachment to materialism, um, that there could be this irrational attachment. And that's maybe not good for people's character. It's not a virtuous state for people to be in. Um, Aristotle talks quite a bit about um, magnanimity and the willingness to share with other people, that that's a, that's a kind of virtue of an excellent person, that they're, um, that they're not just concerned with themselves, you know, not just greedy, and they're willing to kind of work with other people for mutual benefit. Um, maybe capitalism, uh, while saying that it's trying to promote those sorts of things, kind of culturally undermines that value itself. Even though there is the freedom to do that, we don't see people doing that so much. Uh, if people are happy with where they're at, they're not thinking so much about finding new opportunities for win-win scenarios. Um, so maybe there are a lot of lost opportunities there um, that would have to do directly with giving people more freedom in their lives to do more of the things that they want to be able to do. So there's that kind of thing. And he, I, I say, yeah, maybe Cohen's being a little modest here. Maybe that's a weaker sort of argument. It doesn't have this strong force of justice or moral obligation or something like that. Um, but I think he might have a point here. I, I, he might be underselling his argument, I think. But that's just my opinion. Um, his second argument, I think, is a little bit more developed and a little bit more robust. He says, that can work in some situations, but the only way in which it does, those opportunities are available is under the premise that the two parties can negotiate for mutual benefit. So if you're imagining a economy, a free market economy, in which everyone is sort of relatively at the same power level, there's not this huge income inequality or huge inequality in terms of power and control of things like the means of production. Um, there aren't some people, these oligarchs who are holding all the cards, 
then yeah, that kind of makes sense. I mean, it's kind of going back to Adam Smith style capitalism, one of the, the most famous philosophers arguing in favor of free markets um, on a moral on moral grounds. Um, but those are not the circumstances that we're actually in, he says. And this is where maybe an understanding of the concrete circumstances is relevant. That maybe in that kind of theoretical model, capitalism has something to say for itself in terms of how you don't need to go to socialism or communism in order to give people this um, flexibility to gain access to things that are not theirs um, it, through legitimate means, according to the rules of capitalism. But um, he says most situations don't have that shape. We don't come to the bargaining table as equals. There are these power dynamics. This is what Rawls was worried about, um, about uh, uh, a um, consensual um, agreements with people who have different degrees of power are not necessarily going to be fair or equitable um, because one side can leverage that advantage of power over the other um, in a way that really does limit the weaker negotiating position from being able to advocate for their own freedoms more. I mean, that that's kind of a way of rephrasing all of this. Um, and Cohen thinks this is especially true when we're talking about control of the means of production. And I think I want to close here with his arguments by just reading a little bit more from Cohen's own paper. Um, let me kind of pull this up here. Um, ba 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 ba. Where are we here? Here at the end. Um, yeah, how far back do I want to go? Uh, yeah. Let's let's go let's go a couple paragraphs back here. So. So he says, that point aside, it must be granted that contracts often establish desirably communal structures. He's sort of saying that like capitalism, maybe without even deliberately trying, ends up promoting communal values through the bonds of relationship that happen with market transactions. Um, uh, sometimes with transactional costs, which communist rules would not impose, but also without the administrative cons, uh, costs that often attach to public regulation. So he's sort of acknowledging here that there's, um, there are uh, burdens of social cooperation that happen under capitalism and under communism, and they're different. And maybe capitalism has a leg up on communism in certain areas, but there's also going to be other costs here, and that's what we're going to see. But the stated method of achieving communism cannot be generalized. Uh, you, uh, achieving communism through um, free market transactions under capitalism. We could not, by contract, bring into shared ownership those non-household tools and resources which Marxists call means of production. So like farmland or factories, things like this. The basic uh, uh, mechanisms that uh, generate economic value. Since they, why, why can't they one, be one for so socialism by contract? Because they belong to a small minority to whom the rest can offer no quid pro quo. There, there's nothing that like in the situation I gave before of the recession where I'm the factory owner and you're looking for a job and I've got the jobs and I can I can offer really low wages knowing you're going to agree because of your situation. There's nothing you can offer me to gain equal control with me over my means of production. I'm holding all the cards. I'm not just going to give them away. Um, and you don't have anything available to you to negotiate with that will uh, encourage me to give it up. I'm in the power position here. There's no, there's no win-win here. If I'm going to give you control, it's at a loss to myself. And capitalism doesn't encourage those kinds of transactions. Most of the rest must lease their labor power to members of that minority who control the means of production in exchange for some of the proceeds of their labor on facilities in whose ownership they do not share. Okay. So we reach, at length, a central charge with respect to freedom which Marxists lay against capitalism, a concern about capitalism, and which, in my view, well-founded, that in capitalist society, the great majority of people are forced, again, still free, but forced, because of the character of the society, to sell their labor power to others. In properly refined form, this important claim about capitalism liberty is, I am sure, correct, I've attempted to refine it elsewhere. I and mean, he's written a lot of stuff on this subject. This is, I think, just a really good introduction to Cohen's uh, thinking in kind of the big picture. So there's a lot more to talk about, he's saying, and he's like, 
I want to do that. I want to fulfill my burden of proof here. But this is a good start, he thinks. Okay, so that's Cohen. Um, I uh, wish I could entertain some questions here. I'm sure you have a lot. Um, I uh, Again, I just want to kind of express um, how um, I love talking with students and the online format is kind of always like, oh, I wish I could talk to you more. Um, so I'm going to say this in my last lecture, but I'll say it again now. Um, even though we haven't been able to uh, see each other in person, there's actually one person I have met in person. Um, but uh, so many of you I uh, have not had the chance of being able to talk to directly. I've talked with some of you on the phone, especially around the papers and some little email correspondences here and there and that kind of thing. But um, I'm, I'm sure that this class, with all the material we've gone over, it's raised a lot of questions um, and things that might be food for further thought. And I'm always down to pursue that further. I don't know if you're going to be around on campus over the summer um, or if you ever want to meet and chat about this more, talk over the phone. But even after the quarter is over, if you want to talk more about these things, um, I'm always down to do so. I, I think this material is very thought-provoking and very interesting. And kind of um, if, there's a, if there's a Tim Lineman take here on this whole debate around communism and capitalism, um, maybe I'll, I'll leave you with these thoughts. Uh, and if you want to talk about it more with me, I'd love to. Um, I've sort of found myself many times in this um, middle ground between the different positions in this debate. The people who are big fans of capitalism and uh, argue very um, forcefully for it, and the people who are hardcore Marxists, who have very deep, biting criticisms of capitalism um, to the point where they say it's fundamentally unjust. And one big question I've always had, I mean, I'm, uh, I, I'm not saying a moderate position is the right position here. I, I see, the, see why there might be some good arguments in favor of extreme views here. But I, I kind of one big question, this is a framing of a philosophical question that I think helps in exploring this whole territory. Um, on the one hand, with these um, <clears throat> extreme criticisms from the kind of Marxist side, the anti-capitalist views, sometimes they want to cast the situation as sort of saying capitalism is a, a sort of sick, dying patient, and there's no hope of recovery. There's no way in which capitalism can be sort of fixed to escape the moral concerns about it. I don't think Cohen is quite in this camp. Um, but at the same time, there are some pretty significant concerns. Um, there are things about capitalism that deserve our critical reevaluation and reflection on. And I, I think it is an open question here. Is capitalism savable? Are we able to maybe restructure it in some sort of way where it can avoid the moral dangers that we too often see it uh, falling into? Um, or do we need something radically different to evade those moral problems, to correct those injustices, um, and to have a more just society? There, that's a really, really difficult debate to resolve. And I, I think the, the main thing I want to, I, I would say in terms of my contribution here, is don't treat that debate so lightly. Um, hopefully the debate that we've gotten into, the material we've looked at, helps you get some idea of how this is a sticky debate and how it doesn't have ready-made solutions to it, um, easy answers about it, but still that there's hope for making some progress on this, that there are some handholds that we get. So it's not just this like, oh, it's so complicated and impossible, the problem will never solve it, and there's no solution, and blah, 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 but that there is some hope for maybe um, us making some progress and figuring out what would be a better way to do things. And we can disagree about what we think that progress should look like or what steps we should take and all that kind of stuff. But there's hope for, in dialogue around that, figuring it out. Um, one big thing I always like to say about the social and economic justice unit, and it's sort of come through over teaching this class over uh, a few years now, um, that, and this has come from like talking with students, I think sometimes when you've got, because all these views maybe sound familiar with political discussions that happen today in our country, um, that sometimes those debates just seem like they're going nowhere. Like no one's going to convince the other side of their position. No one's going to switch sides because of philosophical or moral arguments that are offered. Um, and it can really feel like um, cynicism is the right answer <laughs> in the sense of like being hopeless or fatalistic about us making any progress on coming to agreement or something like that. Um, definitely the way that that debate too often unfolds in the real world 
gives a lot of evidence for that kind of attitude. I get it. I mean, I understand why sometimes people take that attitude. But I think sometimes understanding the theoretical underpinnings, like a lot of times people throw around these political positions without really understanding the underlying philosophy that would give them moral weight or moral justification. And that's the kind of stuff that we've been studying um, over the last few weeks here with this unit and other things that we've talked about this quarter. And I think sometimes when you've got um, exposure to those ideas, when you understand the theoretical basis for them, it's sort of like we're getting deeper into the debate and maybe getting closer to that point, that linchpin point where it's like, oh, yeah, maybe we could resolve this issue. And once we've got this disagreement resolved, there is, there is a kind of common ground for dialogue here. There is a way in which we might still disagree, but we can at least share a frame of reference that allows us to talk to each other rather than just talk past each other the whole time, where it's just this endless stream of rhetoric. Um, but when we actually start looking at the arguments and the values, I mean, I think Cohen is a fantastic example. He's saying, look, there is grounds for dialogue between capitalists and communists and Marxists that, hey, we're both really about freedom. That's a common shared value here. People want the freedom to be able to do things. There's a lot of things we want to be able to do. And a society that gives people more freedoms is um, morally more just. Um, it's more morally justified than a system that gives less freedoms. That's, that's a common denominator here. And now that gives us direction for how we might pursue this. We can find some way to figure out uh, how to proceed. Rawls, I think, is doing a similar type of project in a very different way. And even Nozick is too, I think. Um, he's trying to offer universal considerations. Um, all of them are trying to offer these universal considerations that no matter where you're at, you can be like, yeah, you know what? That, that value makes sense. I mean, that that. but on balance, how does this all shake out? we got to maybe connect the dots a little bit more. So um, I, 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 one thing I, I always uh, deeply and sincerely hope for is that um, a philosophical education is not just a matter of being able to now engage in some sort of high-minded intellectual debate, but it's actually practically relevant and relevant for this practical project of helping us understand each other and to be able to enable dialogue about difficult issues, which is otherwise very hard to have a dialogue about. So uh, that's kind of my take on this whole thing and what I hope you get out of it. And, and I hope it's been successful in that. And um, if there are things that are unclear, I mean, this is complicated material. Um, it's, it's pretty deep waters, pretty sticky issues. If there's anything I can do to help you um, understand these ideas that does give you access to that conversation and empower you to be able to articulate your own views and understand the ideas of people who have different perspectives than you, um, I'd like to do that. I'd like to be able to help you more with that. That's what this is all about, I think. Um, and so uh, I remain your uh, sincere and humble servant on that project. And you are always free to call on me. Um, it's something I freely offer and I'd like you to take advantage of. So I hope it's been interesting. Um, we've got one more really big picture issue we'll be talking about on Thursday. Um, and I'm definitely not going to delay that lecture, like I said before. We'll, we'll definitely have that happen on Thursday. And I hope as many of you, um, maybe finals will be over and you'll be a little more free to attend. Um, but usually a lot of discussion happens on this last unit because it's really about the meaning of life and kind of putting everything into perspective like um I, it's going to kind of be premised around i can switch my hat now um this idea of success which is oftentimes so deeply woven into our thinking around um the business life and career and um and successful businesses and things like that. we use this language a lot of of success and and thinking about what does success really mean? What are we in this for? Kind of like some of the stuff Cohen's been saying. Like, why do we care? <laughs> why do we care to be able to do some of these things? Um, what is worth doing? What are the freedoms that matter to us? And um, what freedoms are maybe not things that we would care whether we had them or didn't have them? Um, what, are, what are the top priorities here? Because the, the sorts of freedoms that we put more meaning and value on are probably the ones that we want to make sure a just society gives people access to more than freedoms that no one cares about. So uh, that's what we'll be talking about. I hope you'll find that interesting too. I think it'll be a nice capstone to the class. So until later, I will see you. <laughs>